Also, I got this needle little ring light at Target, so that is why the lighting may seem a little bit different. So, So welcome back to my channel if you are new. Hello, welcome. Today, if you cannot tell by the title, I'm going to be going over exclusively pumping 101 must-have information to know. So if you don't know already, if you're not familiar with my channel, I have a almost one-year-old son. Okay, he's going to be one in like four days. No. Yes. So for the last year, I have exclusively pumped for him. My last day will actually probably be in about a, a week or so after she turns a year old. But for the last year, I have exclusively pumped for him and I have learned a lot of information. So I want to take all the information that I have gained over the last year exclusively pumping and share it with you all if there's any mamas out there who are exclusively pumping and maybe have some questions or if you just had a baby and you're kind of starting out but you're not really sure or maybe you're pregnant and you just want to know what your options are for feeding your baby. So. I know when I first started, I had literally no idea what I was doing and if I could redo everything with all the information I know now, it would have been a hell of a lot easier on me. So like always, when I'm filming a video that has a lot of information, I got my handy dandy notebook with everything in it. So if I'm looking down, that is where I'm looking. I may or may not do this, but um, I'm going to try to put the times of things that I'm talking about in the description. If there's something specific you want to know about, check out the description below. So without further ado, sit back, relax, grab some candy or a bucket of popcorn and let's get going. So to start off, I just want to go over basically where it starts and that is with your pump. There's different kinds of pumps, so there's electrical pumps, which usually plug into an outlet of a wall and they just kind of do all the work for you. Um, there's also electrical hands-free pumps that are exactly what they are. They're hands-free, so you don't really got to like hold them. Usually they're portable as well, so they don't got to plug into a wall and you can just kind of like pop them in your bra or things like that. There are also manual pumps, um, so they usually have a little thing that you sit there and you just go like that. Going along with the different kinds of pumps and everything, something I had no idea about was there's different flange sizes. The flange is the little shield that sits on your breast um, that you're nipple gets pulled into to express the milk. And there are different sizes and the size of your flange is all going to depend on the size of your nipple. <laughs> Lord have mercy, we have different size nipples. Without actually phys physically measuring your nipple, you can kind of tell by the eye. If you put the flange to your chest and you center your nipple in the like canal of the flange, there should be an even amount of space from like between the wall of the flange and your nipple. Going off of that, there's also the valve part of the pump that is attached to the flange. There's companies like Medela that have like the valve and the little membrane piece, or there's other companies like Spectra who have the white duckbill valve. Now these are going to need to be replaced I want to say every like four to six weeks, you might be able to push six to eight weeks depending on how often you are pumping. Um, as exclusively pumpers, we do 
have to replace these more often than if we weren't exclusively pumping. So definitely having multiple pump sets and replacement parts is a must because as I've seen it way too many times on my Facebook groups where the dog chewed the shield or the valve and they don't have a backup. So definitely invest in that. Check out your insurance policy. Um, some people can directly call their insurance, but there's also other companies out there, websites like Aeroflow Breast Pumps, where I got my pump from. You put your insurance information and your doctor, and they go in and they see what your insurance covers for breast pumps. So I actually got my pump 100% free. I didn't pay a penny. And it was really awesome. There were other pump options available to me, but they were just extremely discounted, like $20 or $40. So I, not knowing anything, just went for the free option. And to my luck, it worked out and it worked well for me because not every woman responds to pumps and not every pump a woman responds to. So the pump that I have works well for me, my body responds well, but it may not work for you. So that's where it goes as far as doing any kind of research and you may have to invest in multiple pumps. You may be wondering, when do I pump? How often do I pump? How long do I pump for? Well, I got the answer. When your baby is first born, um, I personally nursed for the first two days until my son decided to have a weird latch and cause friction and cause my nipple to be super raw and that is where my pumping journey began. So in the beginning when your baby is a newborn, they typically eat seven to eight times a day, which means that you should, um, in the perfect world, be pumping seven to eight times a day in 24 hours around the clock. That can average every two to three hours forever. So again, something that I didn't really know about. From there, as your baby gets older, you'll eventually kind of wean down to five to six times a day. And then so on and so forth, four to five times a day, three to four times a day, two to three times a day, one to two times a day, until eventually you're just at one time a day and then you just eventually stop pumping when you are ready to finally be a free woman or man because we love equality here. So every time that you pump, you should be pumping until you are empty. The way you can kind of figure that out is I always hand express at the end of my sessions and I basically do that until I don't see super intense streams of milk flowing from my nipples. And you usually can feel it too, like you can feel if you kind of have any milk left in there. Um, I typically will say at least 30 minutes as an exclusive pumper, um, at least 30 minutes. I personally had to pump for 45 minutes and eventually I had to pump for like 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes even over an hour. So it can kind of, you know, just depend on your supply. I kind of want to touch upon this topic, which is a normal under and over supply. A normal supply is considered the same amount of ounces your baby is drinking in 24 hours. So if your baby drinks, 25 ounces a day and you produce 25 ounces a day between all your pumps together, then you have a normal supply. An undersupply is when you produce less than what your baby eats in 24 hours. So baby eats 25 ounces, but you may only be producing 20 ounces. And then there's the oversupply, which is what I was blessed and cursed with. An oversupply is classified as more than your baby drinks 24 hours. So if baby drinks 25 ounces, you produce anywhere from like 26 
up to hundreds of ounces I've seen women. Not hundreds, but like over 100 ounces I've seen women produce a day. So many people are like, oh, I wish I had an oversupply, but it is a blessing and a curse, like I said. It was a blessing because I never had to worry about not having enough milk for him to drink and eat and I was actually able to produce enough to create such a big freezer stash that I can stop at a year postpartum but he still has enough milk to feed him till a year and a half or even more so it's a blessing in that way but it is a curse because number one it's painful I used to wake up some mornings and be so engorged and milk is leaked all over the place and it just physically hurt my boobs would hurt and you know I'd be out in the store and I'd be like oh I know it's time to pump soon because my boobs hurt and it's a curse in the aspect as someone that has an under to normal supply may only need to pump for 20 to 30 minutes but like I said I had to pump for 45 plus minutes every session my morning sessions were anywhere from like an hour to an hour and 15 minutes because I needed to pump until I was empty and that's just that's just what I needed. Now, some people don't like to keep track of their supply, but I personally was obsessed with how many ounces I was producing a day, and what really helped me keep track was this app called Pumplog. Um, it's a free app to download, and you have, I think, like 50 logins until you have to pay, I think it's like $7.99. I don't 100% remember, but it is a small fee and then you have unlimited access to all your pump logins and you can set timers, you can keep track of your freezer stash and it gives a countdown on how long until you need to be done pumping. Some terms you may hear with the breastfeeding world. Exclusively pumping is breastfeeding. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I went to my like six week postpartum and she was like, are you breastfeeding? And I was like, I'm exclusively pumping. And she was like, all right, so then she's not going to do like a breast exam. And I was like, I still want her to check me out even though I'm not nursing. I still want her to make sure that like my breasts are good, you know? And so now I just, if people say, are you breastfeeding? I'm like, yeah. So some terms you may hear in the breastfeeding world are clogs or milk blebs or letdowns. <laughs> so I just kind of want to explain like what they are. So clogs are what they are. They're clogs in your milk duct. It basically stops the milk from flowing into your nipple and out of your breast and so you can get a clog. And this typically you can feel it is a very hard spot, it is sore, um, and they actually can be very dangerous in the sense of if you don't get it out and you don't relieve that pressure and that buildup of milk, you actually can develop an infection called mastitis, which is a really painful, bad infection um, that you need antibiotics for. And it unfortunately causes a lot of women to stop their breastfeeding journey early. I fortunately only ever had to experience one clog. Clogs can sometimes happen because you don't pump until you're empty, or maybe you miss a pump or you go super late with pumping. Like I said, I only had to experience one and I never wanted another one again. There's tons of information about how to relieve a clog, so I'm not really going to talk about that much here but basically what worked for me was lecithin. You can take sunflower lecithin or I just take regular lecithin from CVS and basically what it does is it kind of like grease coats your um, milk ducts in your breast so that fatty milk doesn't stick to the walls and it can just come right out and so it helps to relieve clogs but also prevents them milk blebs. This one I'm still like a little unsure about, but um, from my understanding, they're basically like little blisters on your nipples and sometimes that can be caused from a wrong flange size. So um, yeah, you just basically want to put some nipple cream on there and you know, make sure that your nipples are not rubbing against the walls of the flange. Speaking of nipple cream, 
nipple care is also a huge important thing and it's going to be super important in the very beginning of your pumping journey um, especially if you've never pumped before or breastfed before nipple cream is a really good option I personally really liked the Lansano gel soothing uh, patches that you kind of put over your nipples and they were very very healing to my very very raw damaged nipples thank you Kaden so um, investing in some good nipple care is um, very important <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some breast milk guidelines because I've heard a lot of different a lot of different answers to this, but I'm just going to go off of what my breast pump manual has and told me. So, and also what the lactation consultant told me. So, freshly expressed breast milk at room temperature on the countertop can last for 4 hours. Breast milk in the fridge is good for four days and it's recommended that they go actually in the fridge and not on the door of the fridge since that's constantly being opened. Breast milk in a freezer like a regular fridge freezer is good for six months and breast milk in a deep freezer is good for one year. There's actually no scientific evidence that breast milk goes bad in a deep freezer after a year. The only thing with frozen breast milk is that it just loses a little bit of nutritional value over the course of being frozen, but it's still just as good as fresh milk. But fresh milk is always better than frozen milk. Another term that you may hear with like frozen milk is high lipis. And again, not 100% sure like the whole thing behind it because I personally don't have it, but basically it can make the milk taste a little weird. Um, or smell metallic-y or soapy sometimes and some babies will refuse to drink it. Some babies will drink it if you put like a little drop of alcohol-free vanilla um, extract in it. Some babies won't drink it at all no matter if you put the vanilla or not. So now if you have frozen milk and you thaw it out, um, that milk is good 24 hours from thawed, fully thawed which means that there are no more um, frozen crystals in the milk unless you warm the milk. So any milk that is warmed is good one to two hours. And if baby starts drinking from the bottle, it's good for one hour from the start of drinking it. I'm really getting annoyed at my camera because I don't know, it keeps shutting off. And I don't know, I just think I'm running out of room on all my memory cards. Something you should know, um, I should have put this in when I was talking about the scheduling. Your supply typically regulates around 12 weeks postpartum, which means that you may be producing a lot of milk at the beginning, the first three months, because your hormones are just thriving, okay? And they're producing milk. Well, if let's say you're pumping seven times a day and you are having an oversupply and you say, I'm gonna stop, pumping seven times a day and I'm only going to pump five times a day. So what happens is that as you decrease the amount of milk removals, your body is kind of cueing in saying, hey, baby doesn't need that milk anymore that we're making, so let's stop making it. And so if you drop pumps, more specifically people talk about the middle of the night pumps because that's when people want to sleep. If you drop those pumps early, you could potentially hurt your supply by cueing your body the wrong signals. So it's very important up until you regulate around 12 weeks postpartum that you stay on top of pumping. Now I just kind of want to talk about storing the breast milk once it's pumped. Where do you put it? How do you store it? So there's different ways that you can store it. Um, in the fridge, you can store it either in bottles, in bags, or in a pitcher. One of the methods that I heard about that I kind of wish I did, and I probably would do this for my next baby if I had to exclusively pump, and that is the pitcher method. So basically, at the end of each pump, you have your milk in your bottles. You put the bottles in the fridge, bring the milk down to the temperature of the fridge and then you pour it into a giant pitcher and you make sure it's covered 
and basically you do that after each session cool down the milk in the bottles and then pour it into the pitcher and that is basically the pitcher method and then depending on your situation you can either pour the milk from the pitcher into the bottles or you can pour the milk in the pitcher to be frozen or you can pour the milk in the pitcher into bags to be stored in the fridge so in the beginning when i didn't really know anything um and i literally only had like one to two pumping sets i would take the milk pour it into pre-portioned baggies and the amount of ounces he was drinking and then put that bag or those bags in my fridge usually he was drinking milk from a day or two ago then as i got smarter and i had more pumping sets i basically would pump the milk cap the bottles, put it in the fridge, wait until at night after I did my last pumping session, and then just bag all the milk at once and literally made things so much easier. Now, if you don't have an oversupply, maybe you're an undersupplier or you're a just enougher or you know, you're a normal supply, you can just typically take the milk that you pumped and set it aside for the next feeding and just like store it in the bottles. If you wanna put it in the fridge, you can cap it, put it in the fridge, and then wait um, for it to be warmed for the next feeding. Which brings me to the next topic, which is warming the milk. How do you warm the milk? Well, don't microwave it and you don't boil it. That is a no-no. If you do that, it could potentially um, kill all of the good antibodies and the the good stuff that's making this liquid gold gold okay so um depending on which method you use if you have your milk in a bag or if you have your milk in a bottle if you have your milk in your bottle um you want to look into a bottle warmer something that is good for breast milk since breast milk shouldn't really be heated more than body temperature which i think is like 98 degrees i personally um, invested in the baby brew bottle warmer um, and I really like it because it works well for breast milk it has four different set temperatures um, it is portable has an eight plus hour battery life it warms up the milk in five to fifteen minutes it goes faster if it is fully charged and it is um, portable so you can use it in the car if you're out at a store going over a friend's house and it directly heats the breast milk so the breast milk kind of like sits on a little heating plate it heats the milk directly instead of heating the milk through the plastic bottle or glass bottle but i think mine was about 70 dollars, so definitely worth investing in and doing some research on if you prefer storing your milk in bottles but if you store your milk in bags what i did when I used to do that is just have a glass bowl fill it with some water and I would microwave it and then you just stick the bag in the warm to hot water and that only took maybe like three minutes to warm up now storing frozen milk if I could do this over again this is I think what I would do is I would freeze my milk bags the same amount of ounces each time just to make it easier. I use the Target Up and Up bags. I've only ever had like one milk bag that I completely had to throw out because I lost it in the thawing process. So with those bags, I personally prefer to put four to five ounces. It freezes the flattest. It is, you know, not too much milk to where it's like ripping the seams, but it's not to little milk to where it's not an even flat bag. And so that's the other thing is you want to freeze your bags flat. Some people just kind of throw them in the fridge and then they're all lumpy and bumpy and it makes it more difficult for storing. I personally have like a little brownie pan and then like a flat pan and I just kind of put the milk bags in between that. Some people use cookie sheets. You just want to kind of figure out a system that works well for you so the milk bags can freeze flat. Once you have a lot of frozen milk bags, you then can put those milk bags into bricks, which are basically you take a gallon freezer bag and you just lay the frozen milk bags on top of each other in opposite directions and that creates a brick. 
It makes for easy storage. It makes for a great organizational technique because you can just number the gallon bags. So when you start to use your stash, you can pull bag one and then bag two, or if something happens and they get out of order because you always wanna feed the oldest milk first. It also makes it great that if you do have an oversupply and you want to donate or sell your breast milk, you can sell it by brick and then if they're all the same amount of ounces in the bags um it makes it easy because you can just say okay one brick is 10 five ounce bags and that is pretty much all the information that i have written down that i feel necessary to share a lot of stuff with this whole pumping journey is just doing it and learning. Mistakes are going to be made. You will cry over spilled milk. You will feel defeated and you will feel very tired and exhausted and you will want to stop. But I personally am glad that I pushed through and I kept going. The beginning was the hardest, but the beginning in anything is the hardest. And so I really encourage you that if you are starting out or you've decided on this journey, but you're kind of unsure, just give it a try and push through that first month because I swear as soon as that first month was over, I was like, I can do this. You know, that first month flew by. You know, at the end of the day, if you're pumping and you feel that this really isn't for you and it's, it's just not working, it's okay. It's okay to stop, you know, fed is best. I just personally, my son didn't react well to breast milk. Um, I mean, to formula and so I had to give him my breast milk. Um, I actually had to be dairy free for the first few months because he had a dairy allergy and uh, exclusively pumping is breastfeeding. That is pretty much all the information that I have to share about exclusively pumping. If I missed anything or maybe you have a question that I didn't answer in this video, let me know in the comments and I'll try my best to answer it um, or provide some links to some answers. So uh, yeah, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and if you aren't already, make sure you subscribe and I'll see you guys next time in my next video.